FBI agents hear some tantalizing information about a secret meeting place known as the Square. The FBI and Kansas City Police Intelligence Unit institute a full court press surveillance. And I know there was this one nice man that would come in, and he would, and uh, Bonnie knew him apparently. She'd say hi, and but keep on working, and it wasn't someone that was important enough to stop working and talk to him. But he would walk in, go into Mr. Quinn's office, use the telephone, be in there for a while, leave, and he would come and go. And I think my first impression was that he was probably either an investigator or a process server. And of course, after a few times in and out, they did introduce me to him, and his name was Nick Savella. I worked first at, first as a, an intern and then as an associate at Quinn and Peebles and during the years that we're talking about. And one of the first things that you learn there is that it was assumed that the FBI was wiretapping our telephones, uh, legally, illegally, you know, it was, it was just an assumption, among the lawyers at least. Delona would talk about, we'll meet at the squares. Uh, well, we come to find out that the squares, uh, in, uh, uh, surveillance by the intelligence unit guys and our people and informants and what have you, we put together the squares was the law office of James Patrick Quinn. Quinn had been a long time uh, attorney for uh, outfit figures in Kansas City especially Nick Savella. Mr. Savella would come in looking for Mr. Quinn uh, regularly. <laughs> and if he wasn't there, he'd go in. It was common for him to go into Mr. Quinn's office and sometimes talk, sometimes use the phone. That's, that apparently was the basis of the wiretaps. Here, Nick encourages Tropicana Gaming Executive Carl Thomas to gain political influence. During these conversations, uh, DeLuna and Joe Augusto, who was the main conduit back and forth of information, as Augusto was infiltrating the TROP, he was also giving him a running account of what was happening at the Stardust. Back to the Breckenridge tap, Joe Augusto complains to Tuffy about Lefty Rosenthal's actions at the Stardust. Because there's millions and millions of dollars of fucking investment we have here, you know, in all the different enterprises, and uh, they know that to me uh, that this asshole, you know, he's got a chuck blank, you know, and the leadership is uh, just a stink. You know, whoever is just fucking both between you and I is just a stink. They both stink. I understand exactly what you say, and we've been knowing it for a long time now, Jake. Yeah, yeah. 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 remember, you know, the fact that he said the right thing a long time ago, this guy sells his usefulness. Right. When Joe reminds Tuffy that the frate, or brother, said Lefty had outlived his usefulness, he means that Cork Savella believes Lefty must go. And he does not mean just fired. Nick Savella was right to be worried about Lefty acting up. Joe Augusto was right too, but Augusto was part of the Lefty generation. And in the end, that was a big part of their downfall they acted like they owned the town. Gaming, the evolution of gaming, or the derivative of gaming, was illegal gaming. I speak for the entire state of Nevada. We have all had some run-ins with the law. Lefty, being an ex-convict and not being uh, capable of getting a license, had just kept a low profile. The Gaming Commission subpoenas Lefty to a hearing and denies him permission to work at the Stardust or any other casino. Soon, it comes to light that Lefty is running the gaming at the Stardust. 
and he is called back in front of the commission. He shit with the, with the, with Lefty, you know, he's going to have a long, long per, repercussion to come. He's going to make everybody be, you know, gun shy, you know, to deal him, to promise anything and so forth. This was predictable. They would not even allow me a hearing. No inconsistency. When the chairman had told us that he would give us 10 days, whatever time we needed, until George Swartz spoke up. He said, I'm always informed that because he's not so, he's just went nuts. Now, what the fuck did he know? During the, during, uh, the hearing, he's over there uh, chewing gum and having his hat on it, you know what I mean? And his what? Having his hat, because he's got it uh, the whole plug, yeah, the aircraft. So I was wearing a hat, you know, during the hearing. So this guy goes wild, wild. He gets up to the audience, he goes to the podium, you know, mm-hmm. he gets to the microphone, he challenges everybody, you know. He starts to say this is a goddamn, using the foul language, this is a, a foliar justice, you goddamn asshole. Commissioner Haycock, do you have any comment in front of the public? <laughs> You're usually very vociferous when I don't have a chance to respond to you. Lefty Rosenthal standing up there at a gaming commission meeting, demanding special treatment, saying, yeah, you owe me, I'm in charge. The other guys before them, if they did that, and I'm not saying they didn't do it, it was done very quietly in an office, possibly a phone call, though they were probably more careful, but they certainly weren't out looking for cameras to show the world that they mattered. It's hard to hear you, old girl. I love people that all the best of us are that. I mean, in the hearing room, generally, are there plus people in the hearing room? Yes. Oh, there are? Yeah, the TV, the press, and everything. Are they let them come in the hearing room? Oh, sure. All right, so anyway, when he started all of that, so let me tell you, but uh, there was a press, so even the Washington Post was there, from the Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. There was the, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post. So tomorrow, he should eat all over the country. So he should have a new paper, too. In 1978, commercial airlines would carry small packages called Speedy Packs on their flights for about $25. Here, Tuffy asks Joe Agosto to send him the local newspapers telling about Lefty's hearing. They have a little trouble getting the code right. Tell you the house or go see the attorney at 6.30. You know that the package is there, the attorney's name. Yeah, but I would know of company. Well, it's only one line I'm going to send to your PWA. All right, I'll tell you what. You tell me, go see the attorney at 6.30 and I'll have an eight, and you go to PWA. Okay? Uh, wait a minute now, Jim. Let me get this straight now. I thought the exact time. Here's what you tell me at my house. If I ain't home, you tell my wife. So, look, go see the attorney and tell him to, the attorney needs uh, $6.31 for the copy. Right. That would be the landing time. Right. The landing time, not the flight schedule. I understand. But then I'll look it up, I'll see which flight it is. Alright. But give me the exact schedule landing time. That'd be PWA. Okay. I'll talk to the wife, I give her the landing time. The landing time only. Alright. I tell you what now. If you wanna change companies, because they got quite a few brands that come out of there. All you gotta say is talk. Chuck Hall to go see uh, Tom. Tom is TWA. Bob would be Brandon. Yeah. Okay? He said, uh, if tell I forgot to tell Tom or Bob or you or Mr. Uh, United, what are you going to say? Uh, United, uh, uh, you? You. You. What the fuck's a good you? Mr. Hugo. Mr. Unger. Unger. Mr. Unger. Right. All right. You tell my McGill for me to go see Tom. I take him uh, 675. Or, or, or Bob. Or Mr. Unger. I got you. Time. What time are you going to leave in the house? Well, even if it's me, you got to tell me like yeah, that. Right. One night at the Sands, Dean Martin got on stage and said something like, I own a point in the Sands. You know what that means? I own 10% of four mobsters. Place went crazy. I think even the mobsters went crazy. But I think that in time, so I don't think there is that in time everyone um, faces out there gets, and that, that nature gets corrupted in time. And they can't help but you know, they're right in the midst of something. 
In the election of 1978, a sheriff's deputy named John McCarthy beat Sheriff Ralph Lamb for the Clark County Sheriff's job. In Quinn and Peebles' conference room, Nick tells Tuffy about a conversation with Carl Thomas about the new sheriff. He said that the new guy, the new guy, Sheriff, told him that he, that he had given him the largest individual contribution of anybody. And at the night of the election, he asked CT to cater his victory party. He didn't know where to go or how to handle it. He didn't know how to arrange one hotel, but CT arranged a victory party for about 300 people and had a cater. And it cost him like maybe 3500 I said, he asked him to do that. He said, yes. Yeah. So was he appreciated? He said, it sure seemed like it. Carl Thomas was the biggest shocker to a lot of people in Las Vegas, among those who were involved in the casino business, because he'd been seen as the new generation. And then it comes out, gee, he isn't clean. And it's kind of a reminder of how naive we all can be about the connections that people have. Nick explains how to handle a corrupt politician. There's a line that Paul Laxalt had. Here's a guy who was governor of Nevada, U.S. senator, national chairman of the Republican Party, Ronald Reagan's best friend. Laxalt said, turning down money from Mo Dalitz in Nevada is like a Michigan politician turning down money from General Motors. Ralph Lamb was the sheriff at the time. The Lamb family was a very powerful family. He had quite a reputation uh, as, as being a, a cowboy, some people referred to him. Ran things with an iron fist. He was um, defeated in the election of 1978 by a lieutenant from within the department, uh, Mr. McCarthy. We were so lucky, uh, Sheriff McCarthy won the election. Uh, he brought in his, his crew, uh, Kent Clifford, uh, uh, who was the intelligence officer. Sheriff McCarthy wanted to improve the department's ability to thwart mob influence. He immediately appointed a new commander of the Las Vegas Metro Intelligence Unit. I actually took over the 20th of December of 1978. One uh, day before Christmas, I walked into my office and there was 40 or 50 cases of hard liquor. Where did this come from? We get this every year. I said, what do you mean you get this every year? And he says, the Strip contributes this for our Christmas every year. And I said, get rid of it, and this is the last year that it will ever happen. It wasn't long after that that uh, there was a relationship rekindled between the FBI and Las Vegas Metro. There was a trust factor developed. He claims he's not the guy. The point is, though, how good is the guy? Nobody says that he's a good guy. Well, Carl Thomas giving money to politicians was no big deal. If you were a politician in Las Vegas, you went to the casinos. History showed Carl Thomas did not have the guy. And Sheriff McCarthy and his officers were instrumental in taking down many organized crime figures operating in Las Vegas. The 78 election in Nevada is one of the more important ones the state has ever had. There was a two-term governor, Mike O'Callaghan, wildly popular. Bob Rose was his lieutenant governor, a liberal Democrat, who had a very tough primary because he was too liberal for a lot of Nevada Democrats. In the general election, he's going to face the Republican Attorney General, Bob List. At the Quinn and Peebles office, Tuffy DeLuna indicates to Nick that he is suspicious of Carl Thomas's claim that he is giving their money to a gubernatorial candidate named Bob Rose. I said that he called CT and asked him for a contribution. They were right short of funds. We were very late in the campaign. They needed funds. And he said they got a hold. He called me 
He says, and I could trigger it. I think he said, I can't really exactly say it. I got my little buffer or my little tail and I carried it over the top. Yeah, well, he gave it himself there and swallowed it. So I rose or rose. Yeah, I married it in. Yeah, well, ain't nothing except I didn't know. It was bothering me to think that KCT could be lying to you. Uh, out and out loud. Oh. Just before the election, gubernatorial candidate Attorney General Bob List brought the action against Lefty to kick him out of the stardust. Lefty has told Joe Agosto about a blackmail plan to influence List to drop this action. Augusto, who hates Lefty, is reporting everything that's going on, and he's telling DeLuna that this could be disastrous if they take the, not only Lefty's license, or, or get him out, but they can take the license of the Stardust. He's the end of the skim. Uh, uh, they won't allow him, uh, they don't want to allow him to have any job in the place. Now, I'll tell him what is going to happen. Definitely, they're going to allow him to do every job in the place. He's got to go out there, even if I can pass the point in his place. That's what I'm asking. You say like that about it. No, no. You don't even think they'll let him be a dishwasher? It's not even to be a parked car. You know, and what is going to happen is he that the next move, if he goes in the background and he starts to maneuver for the people the pop, which they know about it, and him with his big mouth, the next move will be the black book. Ah, the black book. Nick wants to talk directly to Lefty, and the discussion is, do you think we need to go to Chicago and tell them that I'm going to talk to Lefty because Lefty, in their vernacular, belongs to Chicago. Everybody in their, in their world belongs to somebody. Lefty belonged to Joseph Joey Doves Ayupa, the underboss of the Chicago outfit. The code for Joey Doves is the number 22. Lefty finally gets the word, and he calls in, talks to Nick, and Nick pretty much lectures him, uh, but in a very, very diplomatic, uh, very uh, calm, uh, non-confrontational term. Nick very subtly gets over to, to, uh, to Lefty uh, that uh, there are uh, uh, ramifications here. At Quinn and Peebles, Nick tells Tuffy about his call to Lefty. Uh, I must ask you, uh, do you have any plans to keep this controversy alive? He says, no, I don't. I said, you don't? He says, I said, you know, I'm glad to hear that. I said, I'll tell you what, so I'm going to advise you. I, wanted, I was going to give you some advice, but since you see the way you do, I'm glad to give you, I'll give you some advice on that. First of all, politicians are fucking whores, the worst type of whores in the world. Number two is that you have not taken a tiger by the tail. This man is in a position now that this governor elect, where he can do a lot of fucking harm to a lot of people. Okay, now look, this is not an individual thing. It doesn't involve this It involves a lot of other people. You understand that? So my advice to be you, as usual, for lack of better words, cool. 